And with, with that, we come to the third talk of this session. And I must first say, so um, uh, the next talk will be given by, what should I say, our own <laughs> local hero, Professor Carsten Specht. Uh, and I should add that uh, I have greatest respect for him to do that because we had to adapt our program a little last minute, to, to be honest, uh, because of unforeseen circumstances. And, and uh, Carsten, he was willing to wrap up uh, current research challenges in fMRI for, for us in his presentation on short notice. This is really amazing and it shows how, how great uh, scientists we have at MMIV. Um, Carsten, if I would uh, read your bio to everyone, this would take all of your time. You, you have uh, graduated from physics, which I think is another important discipline uh, in, in our interdisciplinary collaboration in, in Aachen, I think. I think you got your PhD in Magdeburg and you, you came uh, to Bergen maybe, maybe more than 10 years ago and now you are an esteemed professor uh, uh, among us and we are very glad that we can collaborate on, on interesting uh, uh, neuro projects. You, you also will talk, I guess, about the Restate Pro project that, that you are leading here, which is looking at, at all the factors that are playing into this complex pipeline of studying the brain with fMRI. So without further ado, thanks, Karsten, for enriching us with your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric, for nice introduction. Um, if I could, yes. So in, in, in this uh, little bit short notice presentation, I tried to summarize a little bit uh, the ideas and concepts of the project that we are currently conducting at MMIV, which is looking a little bit into the challenges that we have with clinical fMRI. Um, so fMRI in itself is uh, a method that basically is on the market, I would say, for the last 30 years. And uh, as you could see in, in the one of the images that uh, actually shows Arvid uh, conducting one of the very first fMRI studies in Bergen in 94, uh, the method has, came, has come to, to Bergen quite early after it was invented by Sergei Ugawa, which I luckily met last year in uh, Trondheim with some, with some of my PhDs. So for those who are not that familiar with what fMRI is, I often call it a metabolic echo of a neuronal or uh, brain activation. And what I mean with that, I will uh, introduce you a little bit later. So although we, we have now seen many, many excellent studies on fMRI and we have gathered a lot of information on how the brain works and how we process information, how the, uh, the functional organization, how the structural organization of the brain is. So we, we can do those beautiful meta analysis that nicely separate uh, the different of the brain into very small pieces of information. So in, I took here this example from, uh, from a meta analysis that Cassie Price did a couple of years ago uh, on language processing. And you can see which brain areas are mostly dedicated of processing sentences, which are more on semantics and so and the force. Well, if, if one uh, asks the critical question, did we actually learn something with, with fMI? One probably should go a little bit back in the literature and find the paper uh, from 1934 by uh, Karl Kleist, who was a, a, neuro, a neurologist, and, and uh, he examined soldiers from the First World War. And uh, if, you, if you just compare the two maps, you see that they're actually quite similar. So uh, it, it, it maybe puts the question on the table, did we really learn something from fMI? And uh, those who are familiar with fMI, he actually also had the default mode network in there. He called it the self-perception in a way, if I, in a free translation. Um, well, I, I will come back to that uh, a little bit uh, later, but uh, relating it to clinical fMI. So, where are we now after 30 years of doing fMRI? Uh, well, the problem is that fMRI is currently uh, not suitable to do the diagnostic purpose, but uh, that's where we actually would like to go. So clinical fMRI is, is an attempt of doing fMRI, function magnetic resonance imaging, in a day-by-day in a -day, uh, routine. 
However, uh, even after these 25 to 30 years, fMRI is still done only on pre-surgical mapping predominantly. And pre-surgical mapping is then, in this case, uh, basically only doing sensory mapping, mapping where is the motor cortex, where are perhaps language areas, so that neurosurgeons who are planning an operation uh, get a better idea where to operate, how to navigate uh, uh, during the operation. And the example that I just displayed down there are actually clinical pre-surgical fMRI studies that I did, uh, I feared, 20 years ago. Um, and not much has progressed uh, actually since since then. So the way how it's displayed, of course, but uh, not necessarily the content. So, um, but the question is, what, what do we want? Are we happy with that type of clinical uh, fMRI? Uh, of course, we are not, because uh, what we want in, with clinical fMRI is actually that we would like to have it also for diagnostic purpose, because uh, we, we can't use it for, for, for diagnostics in, in psychiatry or neurology. Uh, we probably would like to have it as therapy monitoring. So it's the CRP that we are applying to, to these patients from neurology. It's, does it has an effect on brain activation, on brain connectivity, uh, or also for, for therapy outcome measures? Um, for doing that, we, we require actually highly reliable methods that uh, really on a single case level can give us the information that we are actually looking for. Um, but so far, all fMRI studies, including the clinical uh, fMRI studies, are typically group studies. So we, we have to look at averages across several uh, subjects to, to make our uh, conclusions, um, except of some very special single cases that, of course, are also present in the literature. But the mainstream of all fMRI-related studies are basically group studies. And as an, just as an example, what we would like to do, I just briefly present one study that uh, we conducted a couple of years ago in stroke patients. And stroke patients, I take that as a case because stroke patients are so unbelievable individual cases because you will never find patients that have the same lesions or the same set of symptoms. Uh, each patient is different. So what we try to, to somewhat navigate uh, or circumvent that problem is to use multivariate method by combining different uh, sources of information. And just to illustrate how, how different uh, these patients are, um, one actually can see that in, in this figure that's displayed here. So these black areas are the individual lesions uh, of, of these uh, different patients. But if one would sum up uh, it, in those uh, probability maps, one probably would end up in, in those kinds of, of maps that, that are very specific in telling you where is the uh, center of mass, basically, uh, of the lesions, but uh, it, it loses uh, all the individual aspects. But if one would do a, a longitudinal study with them, one would see that some of these patients show very big benefit of the therapy that they uh, that they went through and other patients uh, had completely no benefit of it. And that's displayed in, in this figure uh, here that the, the red bars are those uh, improvements of, of these patients. But this, this is multivariate uh, method that we use, this joint ICA, where we actually combine structural and functional data. We could uh, identify the a relationship of uh, where is the lesion and which brain areas need to be activated for showing a good uh, uh, outcome uh, of the therapy. And that's actually information that we would like to see also on the in individual case. So which brain areas is a patient still able to activate? And, and uh, is that a good predictor of uh, giving uh, a good prognosis for, for the patient? So the problem that, that we are facing um, is that uh, most of these methods uh, typically don't work on, on single case, but that's what we actually need. 
And we would like to make the, the out, uh, prediction of the outcome and uh, therapy monitoring. So we heard yesterday also in, in the introduction uh, or in the, in the welcome note, precision medicine. That's basically what, what we also would like to have with this fMRI method that we have individualized therapy uh, based on fMRI results and that we get to much better uh, precision in, in the diagnostics. So uh, why is clinical fMRI still in, in a resting state? And that is not a quote that uh, I just put on there. That's actually the title of an, an article that was uh, published last year, asking basically these questions that I just uh, mentioned. Well, to understand the problem of uh, clinical fMRI and the high variability, you probably also heard the, the issue of this replication crisis. Uh, I try to summarize that a little bit into four different sources of variability that, that we are facing uh, in doing fMRI. So for the first, there's this uh, physiological basis of the fMRI signal. I already said that the fMRI is a kind of a metabolic echo. For those of you who are not that familiar what fMRI is actually based on, it's a very complex chain of processes that have to happen before we actually see a uh, signal change in the fMRI. So it's not only a uh, change in neuronal activity, it, it needs that the, the blood flow increases, that the uh, oxygen extraction rate changes, uh, and uh, the fMRI method then actually, or the bold signal method is actually based on the fact that the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood have different magnetic properties. So we are dependent on the, the ratio of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood changes. And that might not every time be the case. And the amount, how it changes, can depend on very different uh, factors. And some of these factors, and, and I just uh, uh, go a little bit further here at uh, once. Um, a lot, couple of these factors are just displayed on, on this figure because um, the board signal, so the signal that we are measuring with, with our current fMRI method is based on so many uh, me different metabolic uh, aspects. So it depends a little bit on the blood pressure. It, it depends uh, on, uh, for example, um, how much coffee or tea one has had before one w goes to the fMRI ex examination. Uh, different concentration of neurotransmitter has an effect on uh, for example, on the stiffness of the of the artery and or the vessel system, because if there's the vessels are are widening and, and shrinking during the brain activation, so you have a blood volume effect. But that highly depends on, on on these parameters. So there are a lot of metabolic factors that actually contribute to the strength of the of the fMI signal. And uh, on top of that is, for example, one aspect that is also dependent on the circadian rhythm. So, so the circadian rhythm is basically the internal body clock. So each organ has its own clock that uh, contributes basically to, to this complex uh, interaction of, of the body. And we see that also in cognitive performance, that some tasks are better performed in the morning than other tasks. Uh, we see that cortisol, for example, varies over the day. We, we know that uh, the blood pressure varies over the day. And, and cortisol and blood pressure are, for example, already parameters that influence also the strength of the bolt signal. And we just recently in, uh, uh, investigated that by using the data of the human connectome project. And we analyzed almost 600 data sets of, of this uh, huge database and separated them into time bins, depending on at which time point of the day uh, the subjects have been uh, examined. And what we found is that uh, there is actually not much of a change of connectivity over the day, but we see that there is some variation of the bold signal over the day. And th that's somewhat something that really, uh, w where a lot of warning lights uh, lighted up, because uh, it makes it apparently it makes a difference whether you scan your subject in the morning or whether you scan your subject uh, in the evening. Well, uh, those who do clinical fMRI knows that uh, typically you scan your patients during daytime and your control subjects, which are typically healthy subjects that working that are working during uh, the day, are scanned more towards the evening. And voila, you you find a difference between patients and uh, controls, but that might be biased either 
in one or another direction uh, by by this time of, of day effect. So we are now working on uh, replicating that with different databases and also trying to find methods of how to compensate basically for, for this effect. Because of what, what we see, and we also did that by looking at the, at the blood pressure, that uh, the stiffness of the vessel system uh, seems to have an effect on the, how long the bullet signal is, how uh, huge the amplitude is. Uh, and, and many of these analysis methods actually rely on the amplitude of the board signal, but that does not seem to be a very stable uh, signal. We also uh, uh, looked uh, not in, in the Zoom Conitone project, but in other studies uh, on the influence of the concentration of neurotransmitters. So doing MR spectroscopy. So you heard also at, at this conference about spectroscopy already a couple of times. Uh, and also the concentration, the individual concentration of uh, neurotransmitters has an effect on how the board signal actually looks like. Uh, there is one uh, study that uh, looked at GABA that unfortunately was not a study that we did in Bergen, but um, we just mentioned it. Uh, and they could demonstrate that the concentration of GABA in the occipital lobe uh, correlated with the uh, amplitude uh, and the uh, width and latency of the board signal of the visual cortex. So subject with, with uh, lower uh, concentration of, of uh, GABA, for example, had a higher uh, amplitude of the board signal. Um, what we also did is uh, looking at whether the concentration of uh, certain neurotransmitter has also remote effects. And indeed it has. So we, we in a study where we also looked at the functional activation depending on a cognitive control task, we could show that uh, th there are different patterns of brain activations in remote brain areas depending on what is the uh, concentration of glutamate and glutamine within the anterior cingulate cortex, which is one of the main areas that was involved in that task. So the concentration of glutamate in the anterior cingulate cortex actually had an effect on how the brain uh, activates uh, activation were uh, in other brain areas. And we also could replicate that uh, in a way using spectroscopy in the hash dryers and could show that uh, the also, it also has an effect on connectivity patterns. So that's basically a somewhat irritating findings because it shows that uh, there are a lot of individual parameters that are typically not as, uh, assessed uh, in, in fMI that have an effect on how fMI results actually look like. So the problem that this clinical fMI is that uh, the fMI or the board signal that we use for it is so noisy uh, and influenced by so many different uh, individual parameters that it very difficult to run reliable single subject FMI studies. However, that's not the only problem that we are facing with FMI. Uh, it could also be uh, how the FMI study is conducted. Uh, given that you're looking at this very intense uh, stimulus that you're seeing here, that's basically kind of online FMI. So you're seeing this uh, intense checkerboard uh, stimulus. Uh, and the board signal then just comes a couple of seconds later. So that's a very intense stimulus that really drives the, the visual system. However, if you ask the subjects to focus uh, on this stimulus in, in different ways, so either by telling them just ignore the stimulation, just think about something else, or you tell them focus on, the, uh, on this presentation or look for this small letter in, in the in the center of the uh, of the uh, checkerboard if you do a group analysis you basically get very similar results under all three conditions but if you look at the reliability if you just do the same experiment a couple of days later again you see that the reliability of the brain activation although it looks very similar on the group level uh, has a very bad reliability on the individual level. So when subjects are instructed to ignore the stimulus, they basically are able to do that because the brain activation on the second day may look completely different than uh, on the first day. Well, only when they are focused or asked to attend the presentation, uh, and that's shown here with these red uh, blobs, uh, one gets a very reliable 
uh, activation within the visual system and the sensory system um, is one of the uh, main uh, areas where, where we uh, could generate very strong uh, fMRI signals. So just the instruction already has an effect on how the fMRI signal looks like. The other aspect is resting state fMRI. You probably heard about resting state fMRI. Um, if you're not familiar with that, I just briefly introduce it to you. So resting state fMRI is just doing fMRI without a clear instruction. Typically, one asks the subject to either close the eyes or keep the eyes open or uh, look at a fixation cross. And what happens is that the bolt signal during uh, this period uh, starts to fluctuate. And these fluctuations are not random, as one thought in the beginning. They are really uh, meaningful and have a clear temporal spatial characteristic. And that forms those networks that are called resting state networks. And if one compares resting state networks with those that are activated while performing a task, one actually finds a striking uh, similarity between these networks. So on this slide, you see uh, several different brain uh, networks that are active while conducting a task, for example, doing a visual task, that's the one on the, on the top left, or uh, doing a, an auditory task or a cognitive control task. But using, for example, uh, independent component analysis as a method for extracting areas that are uh, showing this, the same temporal characteristic um, over time during a resting state fMRI, one actually sees that the same brain areas that are active, that are involved in doing an active task are also connected during resting state, um, which made a lot of people happy because now they thought, well, while we can do now fMRI without giving a concrete, we still get the same network. Are these real networks, or do we just look at the So the point here is uh, that uh, resting state networks and, and task uh, activation networks are really different uh, in, uh, in in their configuration. So although on the, on the on the global aspect, the networks look very similar during the activation. If one looks at the connectivity, um, and that's displayed here to, to the left, that uh, the, the language area shows a very directed flow of information, while during resting state, one gets a very heterogeneous way of how these different brain areas are um, connected to each other and it exchange information. So although it looks like that brain areas that the same brain areas are activated, their interaction is uh, apparently very different between doing a task and doing a resting state. Then, of course, the MRI system has its own uh, sources of uh, variability. For example, there are local instabilities that could come from, uh, uh, from different sensitivities if you have a multi-channel coil. And that's just displayed on this figure using uh, a longitudinal study uh, with uh, perfusion ASL and looking at which brain areas show reliable uh, ASL perfusion measures. And those areas that are green uh, here on that screen showed a very high variability from one occasion to the next, while the red areas showed more or less the same uh, degree of perfusion during uh, these repeated measurements. But that this is somewhat localized across several subjects somewhat points towards that there is perhaps a different sensitivity of the MR system in that particular part of the brain. Similar with uh, non-uniform uh, uniform intensity distribution, that's an example from a seven Tesla study. Um, that's, that's something that uh, one always has to bear in mind that the distribu distribution of intensities is, is not the same across the entire image. That needs heavy correct. Uh, so this is uh, without uh, correcting uh, uh, for this non-uniform intensity. And that's uh, after the correction. So you, you really see um, a strong recovery of the signal, but it also puts some manipulations to the image. So, so that is a source of variability, uh, for example, between scanners. <laughs> 
We also looked at the reliability of spectroscopy, and here we saw that uh, some uh, metabolites are more reliable in the spectrum than, than others, but I, I don't want to go very much into detail there due to uh, time restrictions. Finally, FMI analysis. Um, what do I mean with that? Well, we, we have this multi-model approach to FMI. We can collect so many different data. We can collect structure data. We can collect FMI data. We can use, uh, we can obtain diffusion tensor imaging. We can do perfusion ASL. We could do a spectroscopy. If you happen to have a MR PET, one could also do PET at the same time, or perhaps also EEG. Um, and that's often that we do in Bergen uh, in, in, within such an FMI session that we have perfusion uh, and spectroscopy and different types of structural images uh, within one session. But the typical way of analyzing it is that we, we, we analyze each modality separately. Um, so we are not really taking advantage of these uh, huge multimodal aspects of, uh, of, of the data. So uh, th that's one of the, the limitations that we, we try to overcome, not analyzing all these things differently, but combining them in a very multimodal approach. So the solution, that's basically uh, what I would like to end uh, with my presentation, is to combine all these different information. That's uh, one part of the project that we are currently uh, well, unfortunately, we are currently not conducting because we were supposed to start in uh, end of March, uh, and for no new reasons, uh, we didn't, uh, but which we hope to start then uh, soon after, uh, uh, after uh, yeah, soon in, in 21. So what we are going to do, we are collecting MRI data with all these different aspects that I, I mentioned, so diffusion, spectroscopy, and so forth doing resting state and task FMI to see uh, also these uh, different aspects. Um, perhaps if, if, if possible, combining it with uh, combined FMI EEG. But we are also collecting saliva samples and blood samples for doing a kind of multi-omics approach. What does multi-omics uh, mean? Well, we are analyzing the blood sample also for all these different markers that perhaps indicate uh, the level of cortisol and of all these different proteins and metabolites that may have an effect on the vascular system and hence ha might have an effect on the bolt signal. And of course, so um, deep learning are very strong uh, contribution uh, to our approach. So by combining all these very uh, which information that we are going to collect and try to form a kind of common data space that uh, allows us to extract more, more or less all these different variables that might influence the variability and that perhaps can be corrected for. And of course, that's uh, the next step going higher and going faster. There are actually two ways of doing that. Um, layer FMI. Uh, that we are going to do hopefully also next year in, in Trondheim on the 7 Tesla is, is a way of looking on not brain activation uh, in a whole, so, uh, but looking at different uh, layers of, of, the, of the cortex. And that's a signal that actually doesn't rest on, on the bolt effect, but uh, looks at the dilation of uh, blood vessels. That's actually a method that also could be done on uh, 3 Tesla, not down to the layer, but using a different source uh, of the signal. And that might be also a new contribution of how to get a uh, more stable way of looking to the, to the data. To summarize, is it all that bad? Well, I think there, there are limitations in the reliability of, of FMI. It's good, good enough for pre-surgical mapping and uh, sensory and, and motor and, and language areas, but um, for doing more or coming beyond that, uh, we probably still have a, a way to go. Because too many factors are influencing the, uh, not, o not only the cognitive functioning that I actually haven't mentioned, cognitive state, uh, of course, has a deep, big effect on, on the brain activation as well, but also all the vascular and, and uh, 
parameters that can influence uh, the board signal. So that's why we are looking for and developing new multivariate and uh, machine deep learning approaches um, to integrate all the uh, uh, available information. And that's basically the ultimate goal of the project to come with some clear uh, guidelines, which parameters one probably should control for in future studies to improve reliability. And hopefully next year I can tell you a little bit more uh, on that, what we what we found. With that, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yes. Thank you, Karsten, for this highly informative talk uh, in which we learned a lot about the current state of fMRI research. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, to you. Uh, let us try and do this quick because there are also some uh, nice um, uh, treats served for the coffee break that is only half an hour long. So um, uh, let me try and do this quick because I think we should have a few questions to you. So Carsten, um, Hauke asks, that um, like time of the day, analysis might be correlated with site or age, uh, especially in multi-site studies. Did you have to correct a lot for such effects in your data? Uh, not yet, because we started with this human connectome project uh, base that were all collected on, on the same uh, scanner site. We, we are now going to uh, the UK Biobank, uh, especially for that reason to see how that influences uh, and, and how, the, yeah, basically the, the things that uh, Hauk mentioned, mm -hmm. where, how large are the side effects, for example. Yeah, very good. Uh, Life has also a very interesting question. He, he says that you mentioned that the functional connectome is stable in a, in a single subject, uh, and he is wondering what can lead to changes in the individual functional connectome? Well, a lot of things can uh, cause changes. It's, uh, of course, depend also on, on, lear on learning. It, uh, it, um, uh, it stable is perhaps a, a too strong word. Um, it, it, at least more stable than the board signal, uh, I would say. Um, so uh, learning and aging are a big factors that can change the uh, connectome. Mm -hmm. And Ingfrid uh, is contemplating about the relatively long time uh, usual fMRI examination takes and whether this could be a limiting factor for the exploitation of fMRI in a clinical setting. And she is asking in particular what clinical indications you foresee as uh, addition uh, of MRI and that would justify this extra time uh, effort needed. Well, uh, from my background, I come from the more from the area of stroke research. So um, I, I'm uh, mostly interested to, to integrate it also in in, uh, in clinical ex examination of stroke patients for, for generating predictions of, of outcomes. Um, and of course, uh, limiting it uh, uh, to a small amount of, of time and making it more efficient is, is one of the ultimate goals of this project. Yeah. Uh, I, I just move on to the next questions because people are longing for the treats here, I guess. So uh, Peter is asking uh, whether you think that the pressure on fMRI research to publish sexy results uh, is uh, hindering uh, the more fundamental work that is, that is needed these, these days. And his question around the Chile on Discord also. A clear yes. That was fast. Uh, thank you for a quick answer. And I have one more question from Wettle, who's hung here. And he is asking you whether you think that other functional MR methods, for example, the VASO method, would be more promising for precision medicine. Uh, I hope so, because uh, VASO rests on a different mechanism than the bolt effect. Uh, and I have some hopes that this might give a more stable signal or correlate of neural activation. Thank you very much. I mean, after a long day, we already uh, need some coffee. We, we, we are still having excellent keynotes to come later. So uh, 
um, everyone should have coffee, but then come back. I think that's the right moment for thanking all the speakers once again for this amazing session.